Well, thanks for joining me today here on the Fireplace Show. You know, we're right between Christmas and New Year's time of family. And, you know, one of the things that we often utilize this time of year is a fireplace. So as a consultant, I often get a question. So, Jerry, how in the world do we make our fireplace more efficient? How can we make it smoke less? How can we get more out of this fireplace? Well, one of the ways you can do that is you can install a wood burning insert into the fireplace or possibly a wood stove. But many people don't want a wood stove. They don't want an insert. They want the ambiance. They want the, they want the romance of the open fire. Real good friend of mine, Chimney Sweep in Portland, Oregon. I saw that he put a photo of his fireplace on Facebook over the Christmas holidays, enjoying it there. So see, there's a lot of people that want that ambiance. They want that romance. They want that look. They want that atmosphere of an open wood-burning fireplace. But today's fireplaces often give us issues. Maybe they don't work right. Maybe they spill smoke into the home. Maybe they create odors and other things. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to go back. I'm going to give you a little bit of history lesson. And we're going to talk about fireplaces and what you got to do to make a fireplace efficient in this world today, where it gives you more heat, creates less smoke, less emissions, and other things. You know, there's nothing better than coming in from a hard day, from a cold world, than fire. Because fire just simply works. It, roam, it warms our bodies. It gives us a comfort feeling. And there's nothing about the beach sitting around the open hearth with the fire burning and enjoying it with your loved ones. So let's talk about this. But see, what's happened here over the past few hundred years is the construction of fireplaces has basically changed tremendously. If we look back at our ancestors, if we look back at TV programs, other things over the years, what we're going to find is we will sign very different fireplaces in older days. You're correct, Jake. How you doing, brother? It's like your, Jay's talking about here. Today, you can get a high efficient fireplace and put in your home. But what we're going to be talking about today, Jay, is going to be how to convert a masonry fireplace and give you that more efficient fireplace with what you have there. So to do this, we're going to take you back in the history a little bit into the 18th century, where there was a gentleman. He was born in Massachusetts. His name was Benjamin Thompson. So Mr. Thompson decided around 1776, it would be a good time to get out of the United States. And the reason being, he supported the King of England. He was what was known as a Tory in those days. So Benjamin Thompson went to Europe and he moved into Germany and he made such remarkable contributions in science and other things that the queen made him the Count of Bavaria, which is a section of Bavaria, a section of Germany. And he's known today as Count Rumford. In fact, if you look in code books and other things, you will find that Count Rumford, actually the way to build a Rumford fireplace is described in international residential codes and others. So what did he do here? Let's talk about Rumford for just a minute. I've told you a little bit about his background, but what Count Rumford also did is Count Rumford corresponded with people like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and other noted researchers and scientists of the day. This book I'm holding up right here is the works of Count Rumford. And this is actually a reprint of his essays that he wrote in those days. If you get this book, you can actually order it off of Amazon, but it will be written in what I would call Old English style. So many of the words are really hard to comprehend because they wrote much difference as they spoke in those days. Okay, But anyway, Count Rumford saw that there was a problem with fireplace construction. One of the things he said, it warms one side of the body, but doesn't warm the other. So Count Rumford, who was a noted researcher, went to work and researched how to build a much better performing open fireplace, an open fire. And what Count Rumford came up with is the Rumford Fireplace Principles. And there's a couple things about the Rumford Principle. And you can see behind me on the charts up here that I've got behind me today, you can kind of see the difference in a Rumford Fireplace, which is this one right here, and an American Fireplace like we see today. When there's vast differences in these. 
Some of the things that Count Rumford talked about was that the rear wall needed to be straight. It needed to be perfectly straight. He also talked about the side walls of the fireplace and the angles of the fireplace, which he said needed to be 135 degrees. He also talked about the way the air would come into the fireplace and what he called the weir and what today we call the lintel. He wanted that to be curved, as you can see in the drawing right over my shoulder. And from the all these things came into play. Good afternoon, Larry. Thank you for joining me today, sir. So all of these things came into play as Rumford designed his fireplace that would produce more heat, use less air, and he did also a lot of the things that are in the design of the fireplace, such as the fireplace throat. Now, where's the fireplace throat? That's where you would probably find your damper, the damper, that thing you open and close to let smoke go up the chimney. And what he wanted to do was he designed that where the sizing was such that it created a nozzle effect. Now, to simulate this in today's world, think of a garden hose that you squeeze down. And once you squeeze it down, what's happening is the water goes farther whenever you do that. And this is part of the studies that he showed in his research of ways to do this. So this was the Rumper principles. But over the ensuing years, people stopped using their fireplaces to heat their homes. Many, if you have an older house or go into an older house, you're going to find sometimes you've got really big fireplaces because they use those large fireplaces to cook. They did other things with them. But those really big fireplaces didn't heat homes. Homes. So in many older Victorian style houses, you'll find very small fireplaces with very shallow depths. They were made to burn coal many times, but they also radiated much more heat into the room. So again, there you go. And Jay, and you're exactly right, Jay. We're going to be talking about those things, prior fires, Aaron's fires, bell fires, all these things we're going to be talking as we go forth in this show today. So as we went on through, like I said, central heat came into play in the world, especially in the United States, where in the 19th century, a lot of people heated their homes off of fireplaces, go into older homes in your, in your areas, and you'll find often every room had a very small fireplace. This is what they heated the homes with, were these fireplaces. Again, you may find a large fireplace, and often it was used for cooking and other things like that. Now, fireplace research, can, however, started back up. There was a gentleman by the name of Rosen in the 1930s, and Rosen did studies in the fireplaces at that time. And like my friend Jay Walker talked about today, a lot of people are using Rosen designs this day in fireplaces. We have a product on the market called a Bell's Fire that actually works from the Rosen principles. Now, in my own lifetime, I've had, the, I've had the privilege of speaking and learning from a lot of people. I can remember my friend Ken Warren, some years, excuse me, Ken Robinson, some years ago, what we did together is we taught, uh, we taught classes around the country. It was to chimney suites, and we were teaching them about diagnosing issues in masonry chimneys. So Ken started talking about Rumford fireplaces because Ken had, tell you a little story here, Ken had went to a home that a guy had had a brand new Rumford fireplace built. And he told the guy, he said, that thing will never work right. It's just not built right. Well, then Ken found out that this consumer had hired a very experienced, well-educated mason from Europe who came in and burnt that fireplace. So from this point, Ken decided that he was going to do research into fireplaces. And some 20, 30 years ago in these classes, Ken taught me a tremendous amount about Rumford fireplaces. Now in the run and the Rumford design and how this worked so much better than the present day fireplaces that we had that were available to people. Other people I've had the privilege to communicate with are people like Jim Buckley, who has designed the Rumford fireplace and works with superior clay tile and produces products for building Rumfords. Another gentleman that I've had the extreme pleasure of meeting and talking with and discussing these things are is a gentleman by the name of Chris 
prior. Now, Chris lives in New York. He is a mason. He builds masonry heaters. But Chris has devised what he calls a prior fire, which is a different looking fireplace, but it radiates heat into the room tremendously. Now, remember, when we talk about radiant heat, we're talking about heat that travels through air and warms objects. So rumper styling fireplaces using the design of a prior fire, a bell fire, a rumpered also for outside fireplaces when you're wanting to radiate that heat into a larger area. Now in fireplace design, I want you to think of it similar to a funnel because that's what we're doing. We are burning wood in the appliance and then we have to funnel it into the flue area. And we do this through a process called laminar air flow. Because what all of these designers do and what I do when I do consulting work with an architectural firm in the consulting side of my own business, we design fireplaces that have laminar flow. We're also using a principle called streamlining. And if you've ever seen a wind tunnel test of a race car or other things, it's kind of like the exact opposite. Instead of the, the vehicle, like a race car, going through, in our case, as we study smoke, we've got to put the smoke and the gases through a cylinder into a smaller area. Often in classes, I describe it as a teepee and other things. But this is also problems that we have in our, in our industry today is many people just don't have good smoke chambers. So see what happens is in today's world, many times a consumer such as you will call a chimney sweep out to their home and the chimney sweep is telling them about problems that they weren't aware of. And one of the big ones here is a smoke chamber problem. And what I'm going to do is to illustrate what a smoke chamber does. I'm going to pull a video up and I'm going to play. It's going to take about two and a half minutes. And this video was produced by a real good friend of mine. His name is Clay Lamb. And he has a YouTube channel called Ask the Chimney Sweep. And you can go there and see a lot of videos that Clay has, has prepared for people that can really help you understand what's happening in the real world out there. So what I'm going to do is this is going to show you about smoke chambers because many times a day, there's going to be a chimney sweep may come out to inspect your chimney and tells you about the problems in the smoke chamber. And the smoke chamber could be a lot of your problems. You can see that right over my head here, I've actually got a cross cutaway of the smoke chamber. The smoke chamber is the area between your damper and where your flu starts. You may call it the flu. You may call it any number of things, but that's the way a fireplace is designed. And many fireplaces have very rough corbelled edges. Like you can see here in the drawing, you can see we've got these rough brick in here. Well, again, what we're trying to do in fireplaces today is create great laminar airflow. So the smoke and the gases will escape out rapidly. So we're going to switch over. Hopefully this video is going to play okay for you. And this will be a video from the Ask the Chimney Sweep series on YouTube.
and we're back okay hope that was informative to you because like i said as the video pointed out smoke chambers laminar flow improper thicknesses these are all concerns to us in the chimney service and the hearth industry because this is the problem we have problems that exist in many fireplaces and chimney systems. And often this is where a chimney technician comes in, they look at your chimney, they're sweeping it and they're finding issues in the chimney. But there's ways to take care of this because for years, codes and standards didn't address it. The smoke chamber parging you've just talked that we, you just saw, that was something that wasn't even addressed 30 to 40 years ago. So if your house is built prior to that period of time, more than likely, you're probably going to have smoke chamber issues in that fireplace. You know, one of the, I was president of the National Chimney Sweep Guild and the Chimney Safety Institute of America for a total of six years. And during that time, we used to have a logo that we promoted out to American consumers. And it's still true today. Don't make an ash of yourself. Now, let me go over a couple more problems that we're commonly finding in the field with open wood burning fireplaces. And there are products that can take care of this, okay? One is we're finding a lot of fireplaces that right under that fire brick, they have built wood. That's correct. There was a form built in and the brick is laying on top of it. And this is now being traced to a lot of house fires because that wood goes through a process called pyrolysis and also called vaporization where it can catch on fire at some time down the road. So again, these are various issues. So we also want to make you aware of the problem with improper ash disposal. So this is a big one, and this accounts for loss of life. I can well remember a few years ago from Stanford, Connecticut, seeing the story about some small children that perished in a house fire that was traced to ashes that were improperly disposed of. Good afternoon, Stephen. Stephen just joined us. And Stephen is one of those experts in the industry that can actually do some of the things we've been talking about of turning your fireplace into a safer appliance for you. So here's our, here's our suggestion to you. Have you had your chimney professionally inspected? Have you had it checked? You see, that's one of the things that the National Fire Protection Association recommends that chimneys be inspected on an annual basis. And what's, the, and what's happening when they come in to do this, the technician that's going to do this for you, they're going to be able to check it for any oddities. They're going to be able to spot the defects. In other words, they're going to assist you in not making an ash of yourself and your home. Because we have problems in chimneys across America. When, you know, I've seen this too much. You know, I've been working in this industry for many, many years. And it's very disheartening. The people that we see get sick in their homes from improper venting appliances because the chimney system isn't venting it properly. Or they have a house fire because many times there's improper clearances from the chimney itself to the framing members around it. And this can be a severe safety issue. So, hey, I appreciate you joining me today. I hope this has given you some things to look at and an understanding of fireplaces and chimney systems that are out there. If you're watching this show, we do this for education of American consumers. And we'd love and we would invite you to share this show on your social media as a way to educate the consumers in your market area, because this is the information that we are trying to get out through our through the production of the fireplace show. We are producing this and we are we are beaming it through quite a few different social media outlets. It's on Facebook. It is on our YouTube channel and we appreciate it. Jay, I really appreciate those words. And, you know, it's a great job of Jay. That's what it's all about. And Jay, so you'll know that's commenting on here. He also served as the president of the National Chimney Sweep Guild for a period of years. So it's all about getting the information out. I don't sell these products. I don't provide the services of repair. I have no vested interest in you buying these things, okay? I'm simply trying to provide you, if you're a consumer, guidance 
and how to make the best decisions for your home and for your family. And with that, we appreciate you joining us today on this edition of The Fireplace Show. Keep watching us. You'll see our shows coming out on a regular basis. We'll be dealing with more and more parts of masonry chimneys, factory built chimneys, and other things, gas logs, creosote. And we'll be having guests on here also that have subject matter expertise. So sharing is caring, guys. Share this out on your social media, please. And I want to thank you so much for being a and watching us today and listening to what we're sharing.